Now that we know about the Cuban Revolution and how the Cuban Communist government began, we can begin to look at what it has done since its fruition. Now one of the first things Castro did after he consolidated power in office was to fly to the United States under their demand. However, Castro refused to meet with President Eisenhower as the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union and between Castro and Nikita Khrushchev had already begun. However, Fidel's primary intention after the revolution was not to establish relationships with the Soviet Union. His first intention was the redistribution through land through the Agrarian Reform Act. Batista's government had placed 75% of all Cuba's industry into foreign hands. The Agrarian Reform Act intended to place the industries back into the hands of normal Cubans. This act even included the redistribution of lands owned by Fidel's family. As you can imagine, this act was extremely popular among the mass of poor Cubans. However, it alienated the middle and upper classes as well as angered the United States. On top of land reform, the act sought out to fix some of the areas neglected by Batista's government, such as health care, education, housing, and road building in rural areas. Ya que nuestra reforma agraria afectó intereses de grandes compañías norteamericanas. A nosotros nos hacían la guerra por hacer la reforma agraria. Y en campo yo después Kennedy estaba promoviendo la reforma agraria en América Latina para evitar revoluciones radicales. After his first stages of the Agrarian Reform Act, Cuban and Soviet relations became a higher priority for Fidel Castro, as well as dealing with the fallout from America for his Reform and Nationalization Acts. One of the first major confrontations between the U.S. and the USSR on Cuban to soil was when the Soviets asked the Cubans to refine their crude oil in their oil refineries that were currently held by American companies. The American companies refused to, to refine the Soviet crude oil and therefore Fidel Castro nationalized them. Yeah, about a year after the agrarian reform was introduced and some American properties, rural properties, the King Ranch and so forth, were nationalized, the Cuban government ordered the foreign refineries, uh, two of which were American, to refine Soviet crude oil. I think their first inclination was to do it, but they were encouraged by the U.S. Treasury Department not to. So they refused. They would not refine the Soviet crude. The Cuban government then nationalized those refineries, the oil companies in Cuba. The United States retaliated for that by cutting off the Cuban sugar quota, and Cuba then retaliated for that by nationalizing all U.S. properties in Cuba. And in October of 1960, the United States imposed the embargo against Cuba. So it was sort of one step led to another. Compañía Cubana de Electricidad. Now you can imagine the economic structure of Cuba after the Agrarian Reform Act, predominantly an inward focused economy, focusing on its own primary and secondary resource structures while ignoring the global economy of the world outside. Massive amounts of trade and support from the Soviet Union made this inward oriented policy very manageable for the Cuban government. They focused on the development of their own roads, infrastructure, education, healthcare, and so on and so forth as dictated by the Agrarian Reform Act. However, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Cuban Communist government needed to find another ways to make its infrastructure stable. They found this predominantly in the form of tourism. They offered millions of mo predominantly European and Canadian tourists to come and share in the natural beauty of Cuba. Tourism surpassed sugar as Cuba's number one industry. And this is what allowed the Cuban government to remain afloat. The Cuban government also found new creative means of trade 
Well, in 1992, the U.S. government tried to strangle out the Cubans by strengthening their embargo. Many European countries, well, I should know that the European Union as a whole does not wish to treat with Cuba. Many individual countries will because they do not have to contend with the massive U.S. competition in that area. Cuba has also found new creative exports and imports. They exported 30,000 teachers and doctors to Venezuela in exchange for 80,000 barrels of crude oil. And while Castro used to be shunned by his Caribbean and Latin American community, he has since then encouraged the cooperation of these communities to come together and combat the richer and more powerful foreign countries and foreign investors. Since this, this cooperation has been proposed, U.S. foreign aid in the area has dropped by 25% and that number continues to drop as Cuba is encouraging profitable trade from her Caribbean neighbors now. Politically speaking, Castro has kept a tight rein on his one-party government as well as the government-owned education and media. However, the country is not entirely communist. There is a 25% private sector complemented by the 75% public-owned. The Cuban government has traditionally kept tight reins on the media and limited internet access. However, this is changing and in the future Cubans will begin, to be, will begin to enjoy more freedom of speech and more liberal usage of the media and the internet. So, now I know what the Cuban government has done since it's come to power, how it's regulated its economy during and after the Soviet Union, as well as we look briefly at the political restrictions and regulations placed by the Castro government on the media, internet, and education. There is one last thing we need to look, about, look at. That is the foreign affairs of Cuba during and after the Soviet Union. All the major political events that have happened between the United States and Cuba have only sought to increase tension between them. As you know, Castro and the United States have not gotten along since he was put into power. As can be clearly seen in examples such as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the nationalization of Cuban land, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and so on and so forth. Although hopes for a brighter diplomatic future with Cuba and the United States do look possible with Obama wishing to take a more diplomatic approach to foreign affairs, but we shall see. As compared to the United States, Canada's relationship with Cuba has been traditionally good. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Prime Minister Diefenbaker refused to support Kennedy's arms embargo of Cuba. And then in the 70s, Trudeau was the first Canadian Prime Minister to go visit Castro. And Canada became the first Western country to open up trade with Cuba again. Traditionally, Trudeau and Castro remained friends even after Trudeau was removed from office. And actually, in the, U in the Cuban International Airport, there is a statue of Pierre Trudeau. The Soviet Union and Cuba maintained very good relationships throughout the duration of the Soviet Union. Soviet foreign aid poured into Cuba constantly. However, when Russia collapsed, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that aid stopped. However, today Cuba and Russia still maintain good foreign relations. Until recently, Castro was shunned by his Latino neighbors. However, this is beginning to change. In 1998, Castro organized a summit of the 16 Caribbean nations, and as I said before, they've come together and agreed to cooperate in order to push out American foreign investment, and now, today, they all encourage and engage in profitable trade. Mexico and Cuba have had a strained relationship ever since Castro was quoted with saying that Mexican students would have an easier time listing off a series of Disney characters than the listing off a series of key figures in Mexican history. Castro has apologized for this comment, however, and Mexican and Cuban relationships are back on foot. Many of the newly emerging socialist states in South America, such as Venezuela and Bolivia, have claimed Castro as a hero, calling him the grandfather of all Latin American revolutionaries, and these countries enjoy very good 
foreign relations. Although there are many other countries and important events that Cuba has shared foreign relations with, there is simply not enough time to go over them all and we must move on.